transportation for nearly 20 years and works primarily in southwest Montana. With her is Joe Wiegand. He holds a bachelor's degree of science and master's of science in fish, fish and wildlife management from Montana State, uh, both of them from Montana State. From June 2004 to 2014, he was employed with FWP for the private land wildlife specialist where he was charged with addressing wildlife impacts on private lands and minimizing impacts from land management activities on wildlife. He's since joined Deb um, in the Department of Transportation and they are here together today to bring us up to speed and what has been going on in our neighboring roadways between the wildlife and human interactions. And I think our 30 seconds has not is not yet up. We're still working, but I'm going to go ahead and I don't know who's starting. Deb's going to start. Deb's going to start. You were the one that was not on. How close does that just have to be? Hello, hello, hi. Okay, this is gonna make me very uncomfortable, but I will do my best. Um, so I think with a group this size, I would hope to keep our presentation relatively informal. And if you have any questions or thoughts as we're going through, I think you can probably feel free to raise your hand and I'm instructed to repeat your question for the record so i will do that and you know we can carry on from there so thanks very much for being here so we are going to talk to you about road ecology from the perspective of the department of transportation a biologist in the in the department of transportation for that matter and as you probably know it's a very new science especially when you would compare it to engineering, which is a very old science. And of course, that's what our department does best, probably. So we are um, trying to find our way and learning a lot as we go. So what we thought was the, the best available science and the way to go even just three years ago, we're finding out after implementation and some monitoring and adaptive management that even today we're still learning new and better ways to apply um, this science to the infrastructure that we build. So <clears throat> just as a little background, the Department of Transportation in Montana is divided into five different districts shown on this map. Each of those districts has its own dedicated biologist. I am in Butte District. Yay! Joe here is new to the Missoula District. And between the two of us, we probably have the most um, experience and need for um, the inclusion of wildlife connectivity, wildlife mitigation on our roads, really simply because of um, the topography and the terrain and the habitat that's available in western Montana compared to further eastern Montana um, and, and also probably the road densities in that type of habitat. So and then we have a Great Falls District, North Central, Billings District, South Central and the Glendive District is all of eastern Montana. <clears throat> so there I am on the North Fork of the Muscleshell River and our main job as a biologist with the Department of Transportation is to make sure our engineers and the rest of the design team consider the impacts to the resource, whether it be streams, wetlands, wildlife, birds, vegetation, whatever, the, the natural environment as we are designing and constructing our highway projects. So the first part of my talk, or our talk, excuse me, Joe, is going to be uh, just an overview of what the biologist does at the Department of Transportation. So as far as field work and report documentation and permitting, this slide summarizes most of what we do for a living. So anytime the department nominates a new project, goes through the design phase, and then of course into construction and following construction, the long-term maintenance of our facilities. We are involved either establishing the baseline conditions of the natural environment and then assessing the potential impacts to that environment that our project may have on those resources. 
And our, our job is to ensure that as a department, we are first and foremost avoiding impacts when we can, minimizing impacts when avoidance is not possible, and finally compensating for unavoidable impacts that result from the development of our infrastructure. And of course, all that must be balanced with, um, you know, certainly safety and the geometrics of the roadway and what's engineeringly feasible to construct. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of um, some of these categories. So with regard to streams and fish, we consider <clears throat> the improving of aquatic organism passage, that culvert, um, is that your, yes, up on the right. Obviously, that's a perched culvert. Fish passage would be incredibly difficult through that structure. So if we were to have a project on a road that had something like this, we would look to oversize the culvert, countersink the culvert, restore a more natural stream function through the culvert so that fish and other organisms can move freely up and down through the stream system. Channel encroachment. Obviously, you'd, we prefer to build roads straighter and wider for the safety of the traveling public. That doesn't always jive with stream sinuosity, so there's occasion that we have that we have to move a channel or, you know, and so we try and do stream restoration in association with our impacts. So that means maintaining the morphology or the function of the stream as opposed to what used to occur more often, which would be you know, the straightening or the ditching of natural stream systems adjacent to the road to get the highway through there. Um, additionally, you'll see that bridge down at the bottom. That's some encroachment of the infrastructure into the stream channel. Um, more recently, our goal is to try and keep all of that outside of the active stream channel and allow for a more natural lateral migration or movement of streams you know underneath our structures so just to some of the things that we deal with for streams we are also responsible for delineating um, wetlands and assessing any impacts we have to wetlands through the corps of engineers permitting and that's a rather involved process that involves a lot of field work and the identification of certain vegetation types soils and hydrology that would determine whether or not something is a wetland and then what we can do to avoid or minimize impacts to that. Special status species includes threatened and endangered species, also species that are under special status management, whether they be big game species managed by FWP or SOC is species of concern, so those are state sensitive species. Um, and also, eagles are under the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, and all other migratory birds fall under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So, all of those species in particular have certain uh, protections afforded them by various laws and regulations. <laughs> that we have to ensure our projects are in compliance with. Right-of-way fence is obviously on all of most, if not all of our roadways to some extent, and something that only very recently we have started to take a much closer look at with regard to how our right-of-way fences may positively or negatively affect the movement of wildlife into and out of the highway corridor. So this is something that has very recently been getting a lot more attention that we're thinking very hard about. Certainly making sure that the fence serves the purposes of the landowners adjacent to the highway and their land use, whether it be um, you know, a cattle ranch or livestock management or it's a residential neighborhood, whatever the case is, <coughs> but also what are the effects that it may or may be not be having on the wildlife movement in that particular area. And the little asterisk there is to remind me to say that towards the end of our talk, we actually have several slides that are going to talk much more specifically in detail about um, different fencing modifications and uh, options that we're considering for improving the permeability of our highway. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you want to talk for a minute? 
I do. I have a giant bottle. Thank you. <laughs> Deb started this off. She's been doing this for 17 years. I've been doing it for three months. So, you know, it felt appropriate to let her get things kicked off. Um, we wanted to focus initially on, you know, the broad scope of what biologists in the Department of Transportation work on, and then, um, you know, blend it into some specific stuff like the mitigation end of things, which is the real fun aspect of, of the job, not just doing the the background technical research and then the uh, look, taking a look at the roadways on the ground and, and what the impacts are. So picking up where Deb left off, um, when we uh, do our site visits on the roadways prior to the, the construction project, we've got to look at the, uh, the, the wildlife on the ground, what's going on with the movement patterns. Uh, we look at game trails, um, tracks, um, uh, the various you know types of evidence for uh, wildlife movement, um, existing structure use, are the wildlife already using some of the bridges and culverts to uh, get across or under uh, the roadway, um, and then the visual evidence of, of uh, road kill animals that are getting hit on the highway, um, and then uh, live critters. Watch for some roadkill to bring for show and tell, and we didn't see any on our way here. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> um, now we'll get into some of the more uh, detailed aspects of what we consider for, for wildlife. Um, on a, the broad landscape, we really want to maintain habitat connectivity for wildlife, you know, whether it's amphibians and, and reptiles or, or large uh, charismatic species like elk, wolves, grizzly bear, whatever it might be on the landscape. And then in addition to the wildlife, we also need to be consider considering um, human safety. We, we need to look at ways that we can reduce the animal vehicle collision aspect of this. <clears throat> and some of you might recognize these photos. These filtered around a number of years back. Um, this was up in Elk Park um, where a, a van of students from I think it was Iowa. It was, it was a Eastern University of van load of students uh, towing a trailer. They they took out, um, I believe, three bull elk on the interstate right there. It, it was pretty ugly. So human safety is huge, and this is just an example of maintaining connectivity. We've got a grizzly bear crossing 191 uh, by Big Sky. And then the unfortunate impact of an impact with a wild animal. Um, and you can notice that this young bull moose is exiting the rear window, which means he already had to have gone through the front window and uh, consider where that passenger was when that bull moose came to rest. So human safety is a big aspect of this. <clears throat> and putting it all in context, you know, th these are vehicle miles traveled in the state of Montana from 1945 to 2009, so about 64, uh, 64 years. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, these are in millions of miles traveled. I mean, it's, it's increasing uh, incredibly what we're seeing uh, going on with uh, vehicle travel in the state of Montana. And likewise, we're seeing an increase in um, reported crashes with animals. And bear in mind, these are reported crashes. Not all in, uh, wild animal uh, vehicle collisions are reported. Uh, and then we've also got domestic uh, livestock shown there also. Um, a steady or de declining trend there, <clears throat> which probably goes hand in hand with uh, a lot of the increased fencing that is, has occurred over time of our highway system. And going right along, you know, prior to uh, high vehicle use, we, you know, roadkill wasn't much of an issue. And uh, animals being bigger than the vehicles. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is just a slide to really um, emphasize the amount of, uh, information that needs to be collected to uh, 
look at how we're going to mitigate uh, wildlife uh, and highway issues. Uh, that I don't. Do you, did you ever notice what um, cor travel uh, highway corridor this was? I was thinking it looked like the upper bitter root, but it may not be. I guess that could be. That that does look like uh, maybe the Jefferson flow. Right there. Okay. Did you have something you wanted to add? I do kind of want to say. Um, so this kind of, I mean, this is the cartoon is important to me as as Joe was saying. You know, in the early days, we still hit animals, but it wasn't a big deal. And when you saw that, you know, increase of vehicle mile travels. The same thing is also happening, you know, managed wildlife. There's more and more wildlife on the landscape as well now. I mean, obviously there was a lot more a long time ago, but that's also increasing. And so we're coming to this intersection now. And one thing that's really neat, this map, is a rather new advent we have at the department. So the MDT maintenance personnel are responsible for picking up all of our roadkill and recording. Um, species, date, location to the tenth of a mile. So over the course of the years, we have generated quite a database <coughs> of carcasses. And now I want you to make sure you understand that carcasses are different than collisions, right? So collisions are actually officially reported accidents that the highway, the highway patrol is dispatched at. Carcasses are just the animals laying on the side of the road. So. As you might imagine, a wildlife vehicle collision typically results in a carcass, but many more carcasses don't necessarily coincide with a reported accident, right? So a semi-truck drives through, hits some deer, they are very much not likely going to report the accident. So there'll be carcasses there, but no accident. So we use a combination of those two databases to try and identify patterns on the landscape and Recently, we have developed some GIS layers that we can map, where we can look at densities of deer hit by a reference post mile marker on the highway. So that helps us hone in. If you look, for example, at these two red dots, I mean, right there, so over the course of the, the query, which is pro likely a five-year period, you know, 11 to 25 deer were hit at that exact mile marker over that period of time. So. This is sort of the first phase of us saying, where do we want to start considering wildlife mitigation on our highways? <laughs> because as you know, we have limited funding. We can't do everything everywhere, even though we might want to. I mean, we have to prioritize where we're doing these types of projects. And this laundry list, hopefully you've read it because we don't really need to walk you through it. But the point of it is, it's very, very complicated. And it's not like we just say, you know, we want wildlife crossing here because, I mean, there's a lot that goes into analyzing that and making the recommendation, the appropriate size, the, you know, who's involved, the adjacent landowners, the agencies, all sorts of different factors come into consideration. And I'll add that Deb and I are extremely <laughs> fortunate in our districts. We've got two of the most progressive districts, you know, in the state when it comes to uh, mitigating wildlife issues with, with the highways. I mean, it's that was one of the reasons that enticed me to come to transportation from Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, is I had been working with Deb for, we've been talking for, for probably about the last, excuse me, the last eight to nine years. And, you know, over that time I had an opportunity to visit with transportation staff in the Butte District here, in the Missoula District, the Kalispell District, um, Billings, and I was amazed at what differences there were within the agency and how progressive you know the, the western side of the state was they they're actually you know thinking you know forward thinking on a lot of projects and considering a lot of these impacts and it just increased my desire when the position became available to to try to, to nab one of these jobs with transportation because they are on the leading edge of, of some of this De deb's laughing but this is my perspective, and it's an honest perspective. That's awesome. Go ahead. <laughs> this, is a, this is a great slide because it really drives home 
the uh, habitat connectivity uh, image where in, in the, the shorter line at the bottom, I mean, th this is what you see a lot going on day in and day out with uh, animal movement. If you can envision uh, a herd of elk, I mean, in the Madison Valley, uh, the Bitterroot Valley, uh, an increasing number of locations across Montana where you've got elk that are spending more time in the, in the open areas and traveling back and forth from security cover to food and, well, a lot of cases, irrigated pivot fields in the lowlands. And they're crossing highways on a daily basis, in the morning, um, at dawn, in the evening, at dusk, you know, at periods of low visibility. You've got a tremendous amount of movement daily. And then with the, with the second one, you've got se seasonal movements, the summer and winter range. You know, you've got these much longer movements um, where they're still crossing uh, highway corridors and often in mass, large numbers of animals crossing. And then you have something like number three, a linkage, linkage corridor. I often think of a grizzly bear or a lynx that has two uh, primary ranges that it uses throughout the year that, it, that it's moving, moving them um, between several different mountain ranges. And I think one of the take home messages of this slide in that regard is just the complexity of what needs to be considered. So depending on which of these scenarios you're dealing with and you know what the road configuration or the traffic volume might be or the landscape looks like in that case is going to help us determine which might be the most appropriate mitigation solution. So something that might work for daily movement may not be the same thing that works for you know a, a linkage corridor where you have more rare carnivores moving through the landscape less frequently for example so all these things go into deciding what may or may not be the most appropriate mitigation and this is just a slide that really summarizes that whole that whole thing so you know we start with a lot of public agency we talked to the fwp wildlife biologists the forest service biologists <coughs> other folks um, certainly the adjacent or affected public we have a lot of public meetings we get local input um, we do different habitat linkage analysis um, whether it be some gis some modeling or some gs layers or what we know to be occupied habitat um, certainly, as I mentioned earlier, the animal vehicle collision data and the carcass data feeds into that, the corridor analysis, and then what is on the ground today as far as land use and development and what is proposed to be on the ground in the future. Because if we are going to put in a crossing structure, the typical life of some of our structures um, like bridges and culverts and what that can be up to 75 years. So if we do something, we're not likely to come back for another 75 years to that location. So we want some assurances in that investment that, you know, a year from now there's not going to be a Walmart where we thought there was going to be a herd of elk, right? Um, and then, of course, the cost-benefit analysis. So, and, and a lot of things feed into that, too. I mean, there's actual dollar figures you can put towards a collision with an, a particular animal based on size property damage, injury, and then also the soft values of losing, you know, the ability to view wildlife or that particular herd or the hunting rights or, you know, anything like that. So that also can become kind of a, a complex analysis, but that all feeds into that decision-making process. And then. Uh, now we're going to cover uh, a number of the ways that we mitigate and, and try to solve some of these linkage issues, um, whether they're daily, uh, seasonal, or, or um, you know, the, the big long-term um, corridor issues, and maintaining genetic diversity across the landscape. Um, I'll give examples of these in a moment, but just briefly, um, we've got various overpass and underpass structures to get animals either over roadways or under them. Um, you know, these are often bridges or, or culverts, um, combination structures um, that might 
uh, facilitate pedestrian passage, pedestrian and bike usage, and, and wildlife passage. Uh, there might be a stream going through that same uh, uh, structure. Uh, sometimes we retrofit existing structures, uh, try to get a, a bridge or a culvert to to meet the needs of wildlife, or, or maybe it's a, uh, a cattle uh, stock underpass. Um, at grade crossings, uh, th these are animal detection systems and signs, um, you know, whether they're, you know, they've got flashing light or a variable message um, that uh, alerts motorists to uh, p potential animals on the on the uh, roadway. And we really look and talk frequently about two different types of fence now when we're talking fencing along right-of-ways. Um, you know, we're talking wildlife friendly, something that animals can get through, and I'll be talking in detail about that at the end, or exclusion, something that we want to absolutely keep wildlife off of the roadway. Um, and then jump outs are usually used in uh, association with an exclusion fence so that if an animal gets in the roadway um, inside an excluded area it can find a way out and all, all of this takes a lot of innovation and collaboration within the agency and and outside with the public and other agencies uh, now we'll just go through a, a number of different designs really give you a good visual image of, of what some of these uh, look like um, the underpasses on the left there, um, you know, th this is where we're trying to get animals under the roadway, keep, keep them from, you know, topping out and, and going over. Uh, overpasses, um, how many folks have been on Highway 93 North headed, headed up towards Flathead? You've seen the really big one in the, in the lower right there. Um, we're not likely to see a lot of those in the future because they're ex extremely expensive. But they are a means of getting animals over the, the roadway and, and hopefully we'll, we'll find more cost effective means of doing that because some wildlife frankly need to go over. They're not likely to go under in an enclosed area. And we need to consider what wildlife we're trying to get across the roadway. That structure uh, is combined with a lot of exclusion fence, eight foot high fence on each side of it that uh -huh. yep, it funnels them to, to that structure. And then that structure also is associated with a lot of smaller underpasses. Um, you, you really don't see those from the roadway unless you happen to stop at some of the bridge, bridges and, and culvert structures that are along there. Uh, but each of those underpasses has an opening to allow animals through and then it, it funnels them to the, to the big one also. Uh, an example of, a, of an arched uh, culvert uh, geared mostly towards mid-sized animals. Um, you might see some black bear, a coyote, bobcat that use, use this type of structure and then all, you know, the, the smaller animal um, rodents, skunks. <coughs> And then for even smaller, you know, skunks, badgers, uh, squirrels, and, and other rodents. I just want to give a little detail on this ramp up here, which is pretty fascinating. And I think it was Professor Carrie Forsman that worked with our um, former Missoula district biologist to develop this um, application. and. It's a great way to retrofit existing culverts that are out on the ground. And so what happens is these culverts were basically seasonally flooded, you know, so during spring runoff, they're full. And obviously then mammals won't use them. But then later on in the summer or towards the fall, they would either only have a little trickle running through them or they would totally dry up. And, you know, we wanted to, in some places, obviously, it's very important for the local population of small mammals to be able to get across the road. So they came up with this ramp that you would bolt to the side and then it has a little down ramp out to the ground at either side of the culvert. So it allows the water to still flow, flow, three, flow freely. And it's amazing the use these things would get. So little animals, I mean, of all different kinds, raccoons and you know weasels and squirrels and mice, and they were just running back and forth like a new little 
rodent highway underneath the underneath the highway. So it was pretty awesome. And then we they saw voles. There was someone who brought up, you know, some local vole population they were very concerned about. And so they actually took a rain gutter and attached the rain gutter to the bottom side of this ramp and had that same thing come down. They called it a vole tube. Crazy amount of use. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So this is what was meant by innovation and collaboration, you know. The sizes and the shapes of structures and crossings and you know applications can be limitless. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this is an evolving practice. So you need to be creative, you need to try new things, and you need to see what works and what doesn't, and you know, be able to go from there. So this is one of the real neat success stories of that. And we do try to locate them in areas that make sense for wildlife also. You know, they're, they're not just placed randomly on the landscape. We try to place them where wildlife are currently trying to get across and, and where they're most, most likely to move. Um, in a lot of areas uh, where we've been replacing, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but in some places we've even replaced culverts and small bridges with longer span uh, bridges uh, to open up that area to make animals more comfortable to move under the highway. So this structure in particular was for, I think there were, it was for elk in the area because an under or a overpass was not feasible and I also think a wolf pack was making pretty good use of this. And this is a fairly old structure, not in my district so I'm not totally familiar with it, but um, one thing I just wanted to elaborate on from the biology standpoint was <clears throat> you think about prey species, right? And they want to be able to see around them at all times because they have to stay alert and they're being hunted. So that's why the, the prey species and the larger they are, the more wary they are of going through small structures that are dark or look like a tunnel and they can't see and they don't know what's on the other side. So that's why, for example, elk and moose, if you're going to use an underpass, they need an incredibly large structure because they need to feel comfortable like they can see around them. The predators, bears, wolves, mountain lions, so on, are much more comfortable going through smaller openings that are dark so they can sneak around, right? They're okay with that. So it depends on what your target species is as well, may greatly influence what type of structure you need to be considering for that particular location. And this is another, another view of that overpass on 93. Uh, examples of a combination structure, we've got an enlarged um, culvert. Uh, it's got a small drainage through the bottom of it, and so it's passing water but maintaining uh, dry ground for small mammals to pass. And then a, a larger bridge over a stream corridor. And, and in combination with that, uh, like near Missoula, you might include a pedestrian path or a, or a, a bicycle path under that. I mean, the, the white tails and small mammals, you know, they, they still use them. Uh, so just fit, fitting the structure to what's needed on the landscape. Uh, stock passes, um, you know, anytime we can enlarge one of these, we're going to get more animals to use them. Uh, turns out livestock really don't use live uh, stock pass as much. <laughs> we were just talking to somebody uh, down along the Madison that, uh, testified to that, a landowner. The, the cows do not use their stock pass. And so one of the reasons for this, I mean, you might be thinking, really, you want to funnel a bunch of wildlife onto the railroad structure? But what we're trying to do is find the most economical way to get wildlife through the highway, right? So if, if building a totally new structure is really not feasible for a particular project or area, is there anything that we can do to help the situation? So for example, this railroad structure, that's at Bozeman Pass. Um, and this is the interstate. So deer were being hit on the interstate at this location in huge numbers. And the trains only travel 35 miles an hour through there and are on a regular schedule. So you know, there's only however many trains a day. <clears throat> so we did a lot of pre-application monitoring 
and found that the deer were already going underneath the bridge in good numbers anyway. And the decision was made that it was better for the deer to take their chances of running across the tracks when they had the opportunity than it was to try and get across the interstate where traffic's running 70 to 80 miles an hour at whatever the 5,000 cars a day or something like that. So, you know, that's where, again, that innovation and collaboration comes through. And it's like, what can you get that can be better than the existing condition for, a, you know, a good price at any given time? I think the odds of uh, feeding 12 trains a day is better than 5,000 via other, other vehicles a day. Um, so we mentioned uh, the exclusion fence before associated with the structures. Um, you know, we do use the exclusion fence, but then when you use that, you also need a means for, uh, for folks that live along that roadway to get home. And we use uh, approach gates and cattle guards. Um, we did find with this cattle guard in the upper right that we do need to uh, put a little bit of fence out along the lower corners uh, because uh, white-tailed deer and other small animals can walk along that edge uh, of that cat, that uh, grate. Um, and then the jump outs that I mentioned. We need jump outs so that when an animal, if, if and when an animal does get in the roadway, when it's bet between the exclusion fence, it can find a way out and, and get off the roadway. Um, another view of a, of a barrier fence with a human passage. So you, uh, got the little style in there so a human can get through there and then uh, and a, the lower view of a wildlife jump out <clears throat> uh, barrier fence associated with a small mammal culvert uh, you know get those animals funneled into the culvert <clears throat> and then here's um, a map of the state of montana uh, showing the crossing structure locations that we have this is probably short by a few uh, but there's over 150 uh, completed um, structures or, or that are in design. I've got probably at the moment another seven that are in design in the Missoula district. Uh, but there are areas that are impractical or impossible, you know, just not the best place to be putting wildlife structures. Um, and, you know, sometimes when these things get designed, folks are looking at a two-dimensional drawing on, on paper, and uh, some things sometimes don't get placed quite where they should be. But, you know, flat terrain where you can't really get under the, the roadway or, or over it economically, um, need to look at other alternatives, um, like wildlife-friendly fence, which I'll be talking about shortly. Uh, high groundwater, high water table. Um, you put in a passage that is filled with water, it's not going to see much use except for maybe uh, in the Nine Pipes area on 93 where you've got a lot of amphibians. Uh, re residential areas, always need to consider what's on each side of the road or what will be on each side of the road in the future. <clears throat> uh, at grade crossings, um, Deb's got some experience with this because she's got, she had some, are they still in the gallery? So we actually did a test project, a pooled fund study with multiple states down near the Yellowstone Park a few years back um, on a section. And it was great, and that's what you see on the right there. And what was interesting about I mean, it, it worked fine, except it was giant and ugly. And of course, it was on approaching the park, so we got a lot of complaints of what in the world is that, and that's hideous and OK. And, so this was sort of the first generation of its kind. And since then, and I don't know how many years ago, I mean, I want to say maybe 10 years ago. So since then, just like all technology, right, electronic technology, it has, of course, advanced incredibly rapidly, got much smaller and much more efficient. And so, I mean, we're working on, you know, fifth and sixth generation adaptations of this type of detection. So it's a little example down there. This one that we tested down there was an actual break the beam technology. So there'd be a beam between each of these posts, and as soon as the beam was broken um, by a large bodied animal, it would trigger those signs so that the, the point of it was you'd have real time warning that there are animals in the highway right of way. And that would ideally influence the drivers to be more alert and slow down. The, the disadvantage of signage and systems like this is that you're still relying on driver response 
So obviously the best case scenario would be to separate the animals from the roadway altogether while still allowing them to go on their merry way. When you, when you can't achieve that, you know, the, the next best scenario would be real-time warning because we all know how many times we've driven by those static deer next 400 miles sign. Well, you don't see a deer, you know, you're not going to pay much attention and pretty soon you sort of zone that out and you're not paying any attention and then lo and behold, there's a deer in front of your car. So the attempt here is to be real-time warning so people take it a bit more seriously when they're encountering that. Um, newer technology now is actually infrared rather than break the beam. So it'll actually detect and shape the body, you know, heat sensing of the animals. Um, so you can know what it is and, you know, we can download that data and all that kind of stuff. So, so we are deploying some of these as an experimental phase in um, a few different locations. Currently, I believe they're still in design. None of them are actually out on the ground right now. And then more signage, you know, um, just above and beyond your static signs, whether it's a flashing light or our variable message signs, you know, and you kind of get to play with different messages. And all you're trying to do is be meaningful for the drivers so that they feel the need to adjust their behavior to try and avoid hitting an animal as they're driving down the road. up by Thompson Falls and this bighorn sheep population is experiencing a just catastrophic decline in the last 20 years. It was probably upwards of 400 animals in this population and they're, they're now down to maybe 60 to 70 animals and there's only two factors that are likely to be driving that population down that quickly. One is the possibility of mountain lions, very rugged, steep terrain. Mount, mountain lion populations are doing very well in this area. And the other one is just like this previous slide showed, 25 sheep hit in 2006. That population is now at the point that if it sees one to two dozen sheep hit on an annual basis, it'll blink out of existence. This area is getting an exclusion fence um, it's in design right now to uh, exclude the, the bighorns off of, off of the highway entirely. And did you have a question? I do. Uh, do you find that signs that just sort of um, the, the bighorn population, do you find that it will cause breakdowns? Is that because they're slowing down? They're slowing down faster? Um, the, the sheep in this area are so visible that the, that's going to occur when they're close to the roadway regardless. And there actually is a wildlife turnoff being planned, a viewing area with this in association with this project. That's a good question. There, there are a few small bands of domestic sheep nearby, but there have not been any carcasses found. You know, no, no diseased carcasses found in this area. It's, it's all been roadkill. And then the, the mountain lion carcasses are obviously not found at all. I have kind of a funny story about that question, though. Gallant Canyon, we have some bighorn sheep right near the turnoff to Big Sky. And we have a sign, just like you're seeing on the right, where it flashes because they're down there seasonally as well. And so just the other day, I was driving through there. And I'm sure most of you have driven that road. So it's windy. People are traveling really fast. The sight distance is not very good. OK. And <laughs> so I see uh, um, you and Lamb just on the other side of the guardrail right against the river. And they're standing there doing their thing, kind of waiting to come across the road or do whatever they're going to do or hanging out along the river. I drive not, I mean, I don't even know how far up, less than a tenth of a mile. And there's a lady with her big camera and a man behind her walking behind the guardrail towards these sheep. So here I am driving by and I'm thinking, OK, what's going to happen when those people get close enough and approach those sheep? Where They're not going to dive into the river and go for a swim. They're going to jump the guardrail and jump, jump right into the driving lane of traffic, right? So there's just some things you can't really help, I guess, is what I'm saying. I mean, a lot of this. Re 
a lot of this depends on driver response and just people making good decisions. And, you know, you can only do so much to help that along, I guess. But no, I kept driving. I they wouldn't let me get out of the car and talk to anybody at that point. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? I did not. It's one of those where you probably don't want to get, get Deb involved in speaking to somebody along the road. <laughs> All right, with this, we're going to uh, merge into a little bit of our research and monitoring. Um, and you know, seeing a little bit of limited time here, we'll, we'll cruise through some of it, but uh, uh, there, there's some neat stuff here because we do have a tremendous number, well, good numbers of uh, wildlife cam cameras out, uh, trail cameras out at a lot of these structures. We've got Western Transportation Institute and um, it's Montana State University working on a number of research projects as associated with these. And uh, yep, a Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribe. And there's a lot more monitoring to do, so maybe there's some opportunities for collabor collaboration here. <clears throat> But uh, this, this looks at the effectiveness of the, of the commonly used measures that we've been talking about. You know, underpass and overpass with that exclusion fencing where we're funneling animals uh, to those structures. Animal vehicle collisions have been um, greatly reduced, up, up to 80, 87%. Animal detection systems, uh, variable, 58 to 67%. Vegetation, just removing a lot of that brush, willow, everything back out of the clear zone uh, and increasing that, that visible margin along the roadway uh, reduce, reduces collisions by 38%. Uh, those seasonal warning signs, you, know, you compare that to the standard ones. You know, the, the little silhouette of the deer jumping, jumping uh, nobody slows down for those as reflected by the, the research. 0% reduction versus those uh, you know, variable message signs that you can get out there with a, a flashing light and, and you know, actually tell people, not year long, not every day, but it, you know, when animals are most likely to be there, that the animals are likely to be there and it's 26% you know, reduction. Do you have a question? So, some of the some of the formal research, um, and Deb, Deb can add to this, but some of the formal research that's been conducted with the underpasses animal detection systems, uh, we do have pre pre and post monitoring. Yeah. Right. So I, I, and I don't know that I have a good answer for that. Um, but what I believe the case is, you look at a stretch of road that um, doesn't have any signage, right? And what's the animal vehicle collision in that stretch of road? Then they deployed a sign. And then they had the sign deployed for X number of years. And then they said, OK, what's the rate of animal vehicle collision now that the sign is up? And they also test like rate of speed. So if you see a sign, do you slow down? Which is what it's trying to get you to do and be more alert. And what they saw was like a, a statistically insignificant change in the number of collisions with deer and or the change of rate of speed. So. You know, yeah, granted, they obviously didn't go back 80 years in real world application. I think it was more like a test stretch of Broadway that they were looking at. And tell you the truth, I mean, I, I'd have to look up this research. I think it was something WTI did, um, Western Transportation Institute. So to get you any better answer than that, I'd have to go look it up. And we do have carcass and collision data um, for stretches of road that aren't, that they're not currently signed. And we do get requests to sign new stretches of road, and there is a process for us to go through to put up new signs. But we do have some of that data to compare to for, for areas that are have been recently signed. That's, I've got it covered. I've, I've got a plan. So 
now we're going to look at some of the monitoring photos because these are great. We, we cut a ton of them out of here. Um, there's a lot of entertaining photos, but uh, you know, here we've got a black bear using a covert. You know, he's, he even smiled for us. Uh, grizzly bear, covert under 93. A lot of these you'll notice are, are under US 93 because we're both south stretch, south of Missoula and north of Missoula. Uh, we've been doing a tremendous amount of uh, camera monitoring. And mountain lion and then a, a mountain lion pair. Uh, coyotes using a, an underpass. Owl, we've got several photos of owls flying, but this one was a nice, clear one of a great horned owl. A uh, family of otters. <coughs> Skunk. Not not uncommon in uh, in our photos. And as a side note, the department has a great website that a lot of these photos are actually on there. You, you can find them in their in the research section of the website. And uh, there's a there's a lot of really good ones that are entertaining. Yeah, mbt.gov. Uh, turkeys using the underpass. Bobcat. Beaver. Nice, nice close up there. So it's amazing how astute these animals are. They, they, they're really good at looking right at the camera when it's going off. They, they hear it, they see it. They, they know it's there. We don't have any human photos. Humans are oblivious. We do have human photos. We didn't put any in here because for very legitimate reasons. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine people traveling roadways at night. They don't, they don't always make it to the rest area. <clears throat> That's fine. That's all good. Um, this is a rare one here. Elk using the underpasses. Uh, as Deb mentioned earlier, for elk to use the underpasses, they need to be big and wide. Um, it would be nice if, if they'd use the, the smaller ones because they're more abundant and they're cheaper to build. <clears throat> this one's Debs. <laughs> I thought you said it's from the from Bats in the Sun. Go Badgers. Is that the little badger? Yep, it's a photo of a badger there. And then this was supposed to pop up, but when I go Badgers, you're going to be like, what? And then I'm going to be like, don't worry, they're renowned diggers. Yay! Let's see you, right? It'll, it'll work. <laughs> okay, now. I'm going to leave you here with a cliffhanger and offer to come back and discuss this one because this one actually can be a standalone topic and I was actually originally going to present this as a standalone topic when I was still with Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Uh, this uh, wildlife friendly fence is, is an area that I worked on extensively over 10 years uh, working with private landowners and it's part of what brought me and Deb together when we first started talking about uh, habitat connectivity and wildlife passage on roadways because the the more freely animals can pass through a fence in a roadway the less likely they are to get stranded within a roadway and uh, I did bring uh, a, a box of guides you're welcome to take as many as you'd like and we'll take questions and I will be back at a future date to discuss wildlife friendly fences you, uh, Can you say it? Can you say it again? Example. Wait. Oh, I'll let her answer first. My answer is probably going to be no. I mean, it depends. Yeah, my answer is it depends. So, locally, for example, like at the Nine Pipes area, they have a lot of turtles that get hit on the highway, right? Now, to a 
car, that's not a big deal. You can run over a turtle and you won't even know what happened. But culturally, it's incredibly important to the people that live there. And obviously, from a local population of turtles, it's also very important from biodiversity standpoint. So we are deploying a bunch of reptile guards and culverts and stuff to try and get the turtles across the highway to do their nesting and not get hit on the highway, right? So, but my answer would be no, because it's zero cost, right? If you run over a turtle, the economic cost to the department, to the driver is basically zero. If you hit an elk, you could lose your life. You certainly have property damage. You, you know what I mean? So there's a real economic and safety driver behind the larger animals from the transportation perspective. Now, from the biological or the biodiversity perspective, I think we address those other things on a more you know, local or specific level where they are either critical or important, or if you're talking about a rare species, you know, is that, am I answering your question a little bit? And that's where it really public support or agency cooperation, you know, really comes into play. I mean, we, we, the highway department works for the people of Montana, right? And so if there's a lot of support or movement or requests or, you know, there's a, a, a good reason to do something, we definitely would take that into consideration and see what could be done. But certainly from a transportation or a safety perspective, it's not a strong a driver. Did you have something else? You, you covered it. Okay. Sure. In the back. Yeah, so I was talking to Stella about that earlier, and I'd have to look into it. We have a whole research department at the, at the highway department, and we go out for research solicitations on an annual basis, and that's also found on our website. So if you have an idea, you anybody can propose the research topic, and then the team gleans through all of those and decides what's interesting or what's not or what they may want to pursue. And then <clears throat> they form that into a scope of work and they go out for a request for proposal. So in that scenario, that process, just because you propose the topic doesn't necessarily mean you are going to get the research, right? Someone else could get it by putting in their request for proposal, qualifications, whatever the case is. However, I believe there are other avenues where we can do like internships or we can work directly with universities in particular. And I'm not sure of all the details, but I was going to follow up with Stella, <coughs> excuse me, on that. So certainly she can hopefully provide some additional information soon. Right. Yes. I, I mean, currently, I'm a champion of a couple of research projects. I don't, are you? <laughs> I mean, and so over, <laughs> but over the course of the years, but it's true. I mean, and that's not a decision that we make individually. I mean, I can be, if it's something that I'm excited about and I think is valuable, then I'm like, hey, this is a great idea. We should look into this. But ultimately, the research review committee decides what's moving forward and what's not.
Yeah. Call us. I think that's fine. I mean, and now I think you have our contact information. You could certainly call us. I mean, obviously, we're biologists, so <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Which is also very interesting, though. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> right. Anyway, yes, I, we are available to have those discussions, and we would welcome them. Yes. Thanks. A list of. Oh, right. We do. We have that too, and that they get they go out on the website as well. So we say we identify what our what did you just say? That was well said. Research needs are for any given annuum, right? A year, and those are internally championed, and they go out through the same process. So rather than accepting a research topic, we determine the topic and the scope ourselves and put it out there for an RFP. So that's also at the research website on our MDT website. And that happens, again, I think, on an annual cycle. Yeah. And when is that cycle? It was just over. Right. Right. I think that sounds right. I, I'll tell you this. I mean, I'm not entirely intimately familiar with that whole process. I can get more information and get the website and get it to Stella. And if you could help, that sounds good. Okay. Great. Sure. Yes, that's a very interesting question. Um, We have a disclaimer attached to our carcass records database because it's not statistically valid. And the reason that is is I believe we have over 50 maintenance sections across the state, right? So there's a group of folks that are responsible for any particular little area in each district. So there's five districts. There's probably 10 to a dozen maintenance sections inside each district. Those are the guys you see out plowing the road and fixing the guardrail and doing all the stuff. Those are the guys. So <clears throat> the some sections are better at it than others as far as being consistent. So one of the issues is we do not have statewide consistency in reporting protocols. We have been working very hard over the last decade to improve that consistency, a little training and education. And remember that slide we had with the map? Now that they see that their data shows up on a map, and I can see that line, so if I have all sorts of great data, and all of a sudden the section boundary comes up, and suddenly I have no data, I am not believing that there hasn't been a single roadkill that happened there. I'm saying, where's your data, right? So you know, over the years, it's developed and improved. However, the other thing is, depending on, in winter, honestly, a lot of the carcasses are literally frozen to the ground. They can't pick them up until spring, and then they're nothing but bones because birds and whatnot have been eating on them. I mean, you know, if you're on a real steep mountainous terrain, an animal gets hit, it may go over the edge of the guardrail, it's down at the bottom, they're certainly not picking that up. So it's not to be used. There's no statistic validity to it whatsoever. What we use it for is pattern identification on the landscape. So all it tells me is, is this section have a higher record of roadkill than this section? And if it does, then I look into it further. You know, Whereas the collision data can actually be used statistically, and that's that data we don't keep internally. We get that data from the highway patrol. And that's also attached with a lot of privacy. And so we can't even, we don't give that out. We don't really use it. All sorts of stuff's redacted. So the carcass data is available. Um, I mean, it's public information, but it's certainly not statistically valid. And there's a whole disclaimer that comes with it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. To reporting it. 
You know, some states do have like a citizen reporting website, and we haven't. We we tried it once through, uh, um, I believe, American Wildlands, who that group is now defunct. But anyway, they launched a citizen reporting database for a while in the Bozeman area, and um, it didn't really take off here. Some states have it and like it a lot, but what what we would do, they also, the other states, their maintenance folks aren't in charge of recording that data, so it's sort of a filler. So currently we do not, um, you know, if you see something that's laying in the middle of the lane or is like a, going to be a problem, you can certainly call the department and someone will be dispatched to get that animal out of there. You should not be stopping and pulling animals out of the highway, right? But certainly, I mean, if you think there's an issue, you could call someone. But eventually, that animal will likely be recorded either way. Yeah, sure. Yeah, like way at the beginning, you mean? Don't. Those are like we call them reference posts because okay, they're mile markers. Okay. Yeah. So either way. So what I'm particularly doing is there is a big section of the number four. All of them have seem to have an increased number of killings. So I mean obviously there's there's two in between one and, and two, but at each post you get a high post. Oh, yeah, yeah, and that, I think that's a reporting error. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So the reporting occurs at the tenth of a mile. So our roads are signed at a mile. So if you stop at wherever on the highway, you're estimating that you're about two-tenths of a mile in, right? So you're at reference post 5.2. So that's what they'll write down. So what I think may be going on there, and I have to check, is that they basically just rounded, they estimated down. So they were within a tenth of a mile of the actual reference post itself, and they basically rounded. You know what I mean? So rather than saying they were at 7.1, <clears throat> they just said they were at 7. Or rather than saying they were at, you know, 4.9, they just said they were at 5. I think that could be the case. Right. Yeah. Right. But this is actually, I mean, this is probably either a five or a ten year look. So it's not a single look. So you don't even know if it was the same person doing it, if they, you know, and there, there's a, a time in our department where they kind of weren't doing it at all. You know, I mean, so the protocol has been evolving. <clears throat> exactly, which was the point I was trying to drive home, that you can't use this and do any type of rigorous analysis on it. It's really just to look at this and for me to be like, whoa, look at those red dots. What's going on there? Or, you know. Correct. Yeah, you never know. And so, right. <clears throat> yep. So, and that's what I'm saying by pattern recognition. So if you look, I mean, obviously I'm not real concerned off the bat up here by reference post 8 or 7, right? Also, all of a sudden I'm looking at between 3 and 1, and I'm thinking, wow, look at what's going on down there. I mean, why is that happening? What's happening? What's the landscape look like? Let's look at that further, you know. <laughs> yes, you can absolutely do that. And we, I mean, that's one of the biggest struggles. Where do you end that fence? Do you tie the fence into a cliff, you know, knowing that that ends? Because end runs is what that's called, is a very real consideration. 
<clears throat> and there's a variety of different ways to try and address that, but it's certainly something you need to think about very hard if you're going to deploy exclusionary fence on the highway. Yeah. No, they don't. Yeah. Right. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. And the other thing we can do with this data too, I mean, this is sort of a, the mapping representation, but we have the ability to chart this data as well and so like you were getting at is it 11 or is it 25 <clears throat> I'll chart the exact number that was recorded at each of those tenths of a mile and then you can see and this is also this is just deer so we, they record all species so this doesn't show you that maybe in addition to that there's five elk hit right here or there's a grizzly bear hit right here or whatever so we have all those species and you can map all those by species by reference post by date by season by whatever and then you can see where peaks are occurring and are those peaks occurring seasonally or are they occurring you know ubiquitous over all time or you know so it helps tell a better story so we look at the same data in a variety of different ways to try and make better decisions <clears throat> this is my district, yeah. So, okay, so we can think about this. So usually, I wouldn't be comparing the interstate to Route 2, right? Because the traffic volumes are incredibly different. The design of the roadway is incredibly different. And the speed traveled is incredibly different. So we try and compare, and that's called route, route type. So I would be comparing more like I-15 to I-90 in different sections across the state and so and all primary primary highways you know the major highways non-interstate would be compared to each other in a general area the secondary roads are compared to each other in a specific area for those reasons then number two i would say generally most accidents probably occur morning and evening but it varies depending on where you are are the animal movements daily, seasonal, large migrations, right? I mean, that all depends. And then most of the animals are traveling at night, and I think that's related to a number of factors. Number one, that's in their nature. They travel at night. Number two, there's that much less traffic on the road. So they may be moving at night, and their chances of getting hit are that much less because there's that many less cars on the road at that time. Um, you know, so that's that was this slide that's up here right now is there's so many variables that you have to think about to come up with where should we prioritize these things and what's the best solution at any given spot. And it's very complicated and nobody always nobody has the best answer. And I think, you know, we're in a position to do the best that we can to reduce animal vehicle collisions and to increase the permeability of the highway. But I mean, really, a lot of these answers is it depends. And it really depends on where you are in the landscape, what road type you're on, what the traffic volumes are like, and what species you're really dealing with. Some research that you might find fairly interesting is uh, research that Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribe did uh, because they do have, they do, they've got radio colored bears, uh, grizzly and black, and they actually monitored movement across the highway you know time of day on, on 93 
uh, frequencies uh, and all of that, and then also did uh, traffic analysis at the same time, so they know what the traffic, uh, the a a annual or average daily traffic volume is. Um, I've also seen something very similar that was done up along the uh, Flathead River, along South of Glacier Park, where they did uh, average uh, daily traffic volume and uh, bear movements across across the the highway up there. I mean, that's some research that would it wouldn't be applicable to to what you've got here, but it it's very interesting to see what those animals are doing and they actually have the actual time of day data that you're, you're getting at what the animals are doing and when and they are keying in on those uh, periods of low traffic volume you know especially just south of glacier there and there's certain animals i mean like grizzly bears for example there's a you know once traffic volume reach, reaches a particular volume or flow there's refusal. So all of a sudden you're not seeing any accidents. Well, why is that? Well, because the animals simply are not crossing the road. It's an actual traffic barrier to animal movement, you know. So, yeah, they will actually wait until there is no traffic or in the evening or the nighttime when the traffic volume is much less than they'll go. But during the day, there's enough traffic that they're simply not even attempting to cross the road. And that's where structures come in very important, you know, because then they're not influenced so much by that traffic volume itself. Yeah. Sure. I know you've done a lot of stuff here, but it's really public school activities. Uh, are you collecting data on uh, dispatchers? Uh, is there any way to research on that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not so much anymore. We did a lot of that type of research, I think, in the late 90s and the early 2000s. And anymore, I'd have to say, by and large, providing fish passage or aquatic organism passage has become standard practice. So it's nothing we really even debate anymore. If we're replacing a structure, be it a culvert or a bridge, on a fish-bearing stream, we are providing for fish passage unless for whatever reason, FWP is requesting, you know, a barrier. If they're trying to restore native trout up in the headwaters and they want to create a barrier to the rainbow or the brook trout down low. So, you know, we work very closely with the FWP fish biologists on those decisions, but certainly by and large, fish and aquatic organism passage is standard practice for us. Pretty much. Well, I mean, yeah, and back in the day, they did pit tag, you know, and, and FWP does their own sampling. So they would certainly be able to alert us if for whatever reason fish are no longer getting through. I mean, that doesn't mean if the stream changes or something happens and the culvert is no longer performing that way, then we would be alerted to that and we could either go in and fix that or, you know, with the next project we would address it again or whatever the case is. But, but Currently, we're not doing a lot of fish research within the department anymore. In fact, I mean, they have hydraulic modeling programs, HECRAS 26 and <clears throat> other things that actually model swimming ability and depth and velocity barriers. And so when hydraulics is recommending a culvert size or shape, they run that program to give them the optimal size, shape, depth of countersinking and substrate composition to provide passage for the weakest swimmers in that system type of thing. But yeah. Really? Yeah, 80s. So I guess generally I would say yes. We, we're all, there's a Western Governors Association, which is the, what is it, how many states? 11 or 13. Yeah, something of the West, right? And, and they 
there's a, there's a real push also from federal highways so that you got a couple things. The Western Governors Association and federal highways pushing regional cooperation and that means I mean amongst and between states and whatnot and lessons learned just like you're speaking of. We have webinars about every other week where we're giving our own, you know, lessons learned and case studies about different applications, not only for wildlife or, you know, fish or natural resources, but a, a variety of practices. And in fact, we just got back from a workshop where there were all sorts of representatives from the Western governors, from the Western states, where we talked specifically about strategies for wildlife mitigation and connectivity, sharing data, you know, so they're having regional databases set up where we can look across state boundaries and, you know, um, what worked in one state and how did they do it and what data did they use and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So. I would say there is a lot of sharing that goes on and, and we are working together. So multiple agencies working together within a state, both federal, state, local, tribal, and multiple states working together and sharing information and, and yeah, helping each other out. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much.